Hi, my name is Carmen Bowman. I have fun calling myself a regulator turned educator. After a career in activities, I became a state surveyor in Colorado and also moved to Baltimore and worked at the Central Office of Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, Division of Nursing Homes, loved it. Got to train surveyors nationally. I've been very fortunate to be a part of many uh, culture change projects uh, over three decades and nationally with CMS, with every partner in the culture change movement. Um, I call my business Educatering, Catering Education for Compliance and Culture Change. And the reason for that is you can't have one without the other. I've just seen in my career that if you're talking about regulations, guess what? The best way to meet them is through our culture change practices. And if you're talking about culture change, guess what everybody wonders about? The regulations. And it's my joy to show people that you can have them both. And culture change, changing institutional culture is the way to go. And it's the way to be compliant. And it's the way to create home and life and living for those who actually live there. In fact, that's what culture change means. We're talking about just only when we think of change or transformation, we're talking about the institutional culture. And it really calls for a shift in how we all look at this building, uh, rather than looking at it as only a medical, clinical, skilled nursing facility, <laughs> that it's actually home to the people who live there. In fact, I've been wondering lately about maybe we should think of ourselves as home health care professionals because we are actually walking in and out of people's home. And the, the teams that recognize that and start to talk about that, they start to unravel the institutional trappings and instead really protect the fact that this is the people's home who lives here. In fact, Dr. Bill Thomas, uh, the founder of the Eden Alternative and the Greenhouse Project and many other things, he encourages us to be aware of what he calls the institutional dragon. And he's right. He, he, he loves to put things in analogies that we need to slay this dragon and it's very hard, but it can be done. You are going to see in this video how it's been done and we invite all of you to consider also doing it. My own culture change journey started with Dr. Bill Thomas's first book, uh, Life Worth Living. That's how I fell in love with the culture change movement, the Eden Alternative, quality of life. I'm proud to be an Eden Alternative associate and Eden Alternative mentor for many years. And look at what his book is called, Life Worth Living. In fact, it's leaders like Dr. Thomas that have shown us that we need to talk more about life and living that people are doing instead of the care that we are providing and that they are receiving. In fact, uh, Dr. Bill Thomas, who is a physician, uh, teaches that if you think of your and my life, if you think of your life, here's your big, beautiful life. How much medical care do you have? Usually it's just a little bit on the side. And now you live in a nursing home and the big part is actually the medical care part, medical care, clinical care, treatment, therapy, medications, right? And the real life part is a little on the side. And we would like to switch that and create, give people, of course, back their big, beautiful life. Uh, medical care should just be on the side. Let's look at the language. I'd love to show you something here. So if someone older has to move out of their home, the time has come to leave this dear home of 40 years that's so hard. Where do most people tend to move to first? Independent, what's it called? Independent living. And then they need more assistance. And where do they move to? Assisted, what's it called? Assisted living. And then they need more care. And what do we call it? Long-term care. I want you to watch this. Where did the living go? Even in our language, even in our titles, the living disappeared, but it doesn't have to. Something else I want to show you, and I'll bring it together here, uh, CMS in the State Operations Manual, first section, definitions. Back in 2016, 
defined for the first time person-centered care. It means to focus on the resident as the locus of control and support the resident, the person, in making their own choices and having control over their daily lives. Sadly, most nursing homes aren't known for that, but it's right in the regs. And something I wanna point out is, to be honest, I don't know that that really defines care. I think it defines living. It's more than care. In fact, beware, person-centered care is not the same as culture change. Somewhere along the way, start people started to intertwine, interchange the terms. Culture includes care, but it's a lot more than care. So person-centered care does not equal culture change. And to be honest, the idea, the language of person-centered was already outdated when CMS did publish this in 2016. So think about person-centered, wow, that's good, right? But in the movement, we had already moved on to calling it person-directed. Uh, one of the leaders in our movement, Maggie, Dr. Maggie Calkins, pointed out um, at a big national event, the Creating Home Symposium in 2018, that self-directed is what we mean. Because you and I want to self-direct our life as long as we live, no matter where we live. And so we had moved on to person-directed, self-directed, resident-directed, and we had moved on from care. Think about this. Care gets talked about a lot. Medical care, clinical care, 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 long-term care, person-centered care. And what's missing, like I pointed out, even in the definition, <laughs> I think it represents life personally. And so learning from others in this movement, we need to focus more on the life that people are living and not just the care that they are receiving. And we'd love to invite you to join us. In fact, that's a premise of this culture change grant project that's been taking place in Wyoming for three years. We call it implementing culture change throughout Wyoming, affecting resident directed living and get this, team member retention. Why? Because 30 years of our culture change movement have shown you will ret ret retain and recruit team members to want to work there when it's a change culture. So with that focus on life and living, um, I, I got a grant uh, to work in the state of Wyoming and the grant itself is called Implementing Culture Change Throughout Wyoming, Affecting Resident Directed Living and Team Member Retention. Changing institutional culture tends to have all the outcomes we want. Uh, people want to work there, so you have less turnover, you have higher retention. We see it over and over. People want to live there, so your nursing home is full, which is what the business side wants. And when you give very individualized, uh, preference-based, um, I don't even want to say care, when you honor someone's life and how they want to live, uh, it's more efficient. You're going to hear that. And so part of this grant um, was to have an annual conference. And one year, it was the annual conference was supposed to be five workshops throughout Wyoming, and we were going to go to five homes that are changing institutional culture. Well, that didn't happen, and it got changed into five videos. This is one of them. And so we are going to show you uh, what a home has done that has adhered to the Eden Alternative. This is simply a pathway to change institutional culture, actually started by Dr. Bill Thomas and his wife Jude. We're grateful to them. And we're gonna see how it really impacted uh, this particular community. And we now go to the great state of Wyoming and we zoom in to Fort Washakie and you now get to hear the culture change, the transformation, the Eden alternative story of Morningstar Care Center. Hello, my name is Tammy Reed and I am the administrator at Morningstar Care Center, our wonderful home located on the Wind River Reservation and Fort Washakie, Wyoming. Morningstar Care Center, the sacred circle. <clears throat> In Native American traditions, life is a sacred circle. All of life is formed in a circle with creator in the center of all creation. This circle is represented by the drum 
and the edge of the drum represents all living things. The drum holds great cultural power and spirit. It carries the heartbeat of Mother Earth and calls the spirits together. The drum can restore balance and renewal to people who listen to this heartbeat. Former leaders of the Eastern Shoshone tribe knew there was a great need for a safe place for the elders of the tribe to be able to go, to be cared for, and to remain in our community. A plan was formed, and in 1985, the doors of the first Native American nursing home in the state of Wyoming was opened. The drumbeat of Morning Star started beating. Over the years, Morning Star functioned as a typical institutional style nursing home, similar to other nursing homes across America. It had its share of revolving door administrators, various management companies, and financial struggles. The institutionalized setting dictated how the residents lived. They were told when to get up, when to eat, when to sleep. The staff were the bosses and outings were limited or non-existent and showers were cold. But the drumbeat of Morning Star continued very, very softly. A few years ago, an administrative team leader read about the Eaton Alternative. Discussions were held among staff and we agreed upon Morning Star needing a new direction. Morning Star needed revived. It needed renewal and its balance restored. Morning Star needed to revive its sacred circle of life. The staff started researching best practices and resident center care. We sent our first team of staff to the Eden Alternative Training in 2015. Our journey to a new and brighter Morning Star began. On February 26, 2018, Morning Star became the first Native American nursing home in the United States to be listed on the Eden Registry. Our staff started the journey of learning teamwork and empowerment. The language at Morning Star changed. Our residents became elders. Our facility became a community. Our feeders became assisting to eat. Respect, dignity, and pride became our new buzzwords. And Morning Star started to breathe and the drum beat a little louder. We tore out the institutional shower room and the shower room became a spa. Vanity cupboards and towel warmers were installed in all the bathrooms. We tore out the institutional style of the nurse's station and we replaced it with a simple desk. Soft upholstered rocking chairs were placed by the desk so our elders can sit, visit, and feel comfortable in their home. We installed warm and inviting hardwood style flooring, comfy new furniture and curtains. A large bird aviary was purchased and 13 birds live with us now and our elders love them and spend a lot of time with the birds. They watch the baby birds hatch and begin their new lives. In addition, we have several chickens and ducks that live at Morning Star. The elders can pet and hold them, help gather eggs, or just enjoy watching them through the windows. We were invited to join our local tribal health programs to join their hard horse culture activities. Our elders attend horse culture whenever it's available. The elders can ride or just pet and love the horses. And Morning Star breathed a little easier and our drum beat a little louder. We added a patio in the back of the building and built wheelchair accessible flower and vegetable planters so our elders could feel the warm soil and watch their flowers and gardens grow. We added an additional patio in the front of the building so elders can watch life around them and visit with their families outside on warm summer days. We included a memory walk and gazebo, and our elders can enjoy the memory walk with their families or just enjoy a cup of coffee and read the newspaper outside. We placed a portable fire pit on the patio so we can have hot dogs and s'mores in the summer evenings. A warm summer night might find the elders of Morning Star sitting on our new patio enjoying fireworks and looking at the stars. We began to have annual community carnivals with bouncy houses, live music, dunk tanks, petting zoo, cotton candy, and most importantly, children's laughter. We had our first fall community festival with live music, 
hot apple cider and hot chocolate treats. Our elders started taking trips to go fishing, to attend picnics or walks to the river. Our elders also enjoy seeing the tribe's new buffalo herd, to visit the Bighorn Sheep Center, or attend a local powwow, sun dance, or maybe go bowling. We entered floats in the parade and sponsored the community nursing home awareness walk. Our elder walk recognizes not only the elders who live in our community, but our elder employees who work very hard every day at Morningstar. The community began to enter our doors again, and the students from all of the local schools started visiting and coming to spend time with us. Smiles and laughter started to flow freely, and Morningstar gained momentum, breathed deeper, and our drum beat louder and now could be heard. We initiated open dining, and our elders began to wake up when they wanted. They learned that they could eat when, when they wanted and what they wanted. Our elders learned it's okay to say that they don't like a particular food and they don't have to eat it. There are always other choices. They enjoy the foods of the heritage and getting to dine with their families. Our elders can go to the local school's basketball games so they can watch their grandchildren play. They also love attending the school's culture night and visiting with relatives and other members of the community. We go on shopping trips, health fairs, and community-sponsored events. Some of our elders just like to sit and gaze at our beautiful Wind River Mountains, and that's okay too. During the same time period, other na Native nursing homes across America and in Alaska felt the need to collaborate and focus on Native traditions that are so important to our elders. A group was formed in the fall of 2015 and Morningstar joined its ranks. It is known as UNITE, Uniting Nursing Homes and Tribal Excellence. The collaboration saw the need to allow Native nursing homes to have traditional foods and establish best practices with CMS. Morningstar accepted our first deer and first elk from community members. The Eastern Shoshone Tribe also started their own buffalo herd. We now are given buffalo meat for our elders. They enjoy this. Local singers and drummers for the best and sing traditional songs and we dance. The local schools bring the students and we enjoy traditional dances and songs. We've also started focusing on bringing traditional languages and we do traditional seedering in our home. We do not believe elders come to where and start to die, they come to live. The human habitat we've created allows our elders to continue life with plants, children, and animals. It allows our elders and community children to have a life worth living. As we continue the journey of laughter, song, music, and activities, our building is full and loved, and we know we have created a home and community where people are loved. The institutional bonds have been removed. But the heartbeat of Morningstar, our drum, beats clear, strong, and loud. Our sacred circle is complete. Um, the Eden Alternative is a principle that helps to cure loneliness, boredom, and helplessness that most people feel when they come to a nursing home, they feel like all of their rights have been stripped. They're lonely for their items at home, for their family, their friends, and just that normalcy. So part of the Eden alternative is to bring them in, make sure that those plagues are not affecting their day-to-day -day life and making sure that we're addressing the whole person So Kelly is springboarding us in to start learning about both the principles and the plagues that she referred to. And it starts with um, an epiphany moment that Dr. Bill Thomas had many years ago, again, as a physician. Apparently he was in with a person named Rose. She had a rash, he prescribed a cream. And Rose said to the good doctor, come here. And he leaned over and Rose said, doctor, I am so lonely. Dr. Bill Thomas went home and looked in all his medical books. And do you think he found loneliness? No. 
and that is what set him on this path. He was honest. What we've learned about changing culture is to be honest, like wow. And he built this whole uh, pathway on wouldn't it be better to live in a garden than an institution? It is built and based upon the Garden of Eden, uh, the Eden Alternative, and it is built upon 10 principles. And we're going to use Morningstar as our teacher in learning the 10 principles. Principle one says loneliness, helplessness, and boredom are painful and destructive to our health and our well being. Yes. We've all just come through a pandemic. We've seen lots of loneliness. Perhaps we've felt it ourselves. Now, the Eden Alternative has created these principles, um, kind of a new edition, if you will, 2020. And so there, there's also an original set of them. So some of us are very familiar with how they have also um, used to be said. <laughs> Bear with me. And this is where the plagues come into it. Uh, the Eden Alternative recognized that the three plagues of loneliness, helplessness, and boredom are really what account for the bulk of suffering among our elders. Again, the physician realized, I can give a medication for high blood pressure. What do I do about loneliness? There's no pill, there's no therapy, there's no treatment. And he was right, but we can do lots of things to help with loneliness, can't we? And I wanna really highlight that word plague Oh my goodness, what's another name for plague? <laughs> maybe epidemic, maybe pandemic. And think about this, our whole world was turned upside down for every single one of us because of a pandemic. And yet these plagues have been around since we built nursing homes. The plagues of loneliness, boredom, and helplessness must be dealt with. Eden gives us a way to deal with them and you're going to hear how this community goes after them. I see a lot of difference. I see a lot of, um, I would say, like more love and more affection in this home. And the elders teach you like family. <sighs> Nona talking about love. Guess what? She's right on. I was so inspired through the years with leaders in our movement, including Bill Thomas and many other, particularly men, businessmen who are up on the big stage and they actually admit we are in the business of love. <laughs> it takes leaders to say things like that, doesn't it? To be honest with what we're doing. And so that leads us into principle number two, that a caring, inclusive, and vibrant community enables all of us, regardless of our age or our ability to experience well-being. Could be another way of saying love, couldn't it? And it's also been said this way, that an elder-centered community is gonna to commit to creating a human habitat where life revolves around close and continuing contact, love that, with plants, animals, and children. It is these relationships that provide all of us, no matter our age, young and old, with a pathway to a life worth living. Now, what do plants, animals, and children actually have in common? Ha! <laughs> uh, they have in common the fact that they are living. You know, it's sad to me that if you think of what most institutional nursing homes look like, we've all seen it, looks a lot like a hospital, to me, it feels like we suck the life right out of it. Have you ever thought that? And so think about habitat. What is a habitat? We looked it up. What is it? It's a natural home. It's a nat, what would be natural, <laughs> a natural home where people would live, where animals would live, where plants would live. Sadly, most nursing homes don't feel very natural, do they? But we can change that. And so wait till you hear even more about this human habitat, which is also home for people of, of many ages coming and going, uh, working there like Nona, plants and gardens, as well as animals. It's more like a community than a, like a facility. It's been a hit, you know, like we uh, have a strawberry patch here at the, at the building and uh, 
I actually feel like it's probably the best strawberry patch in our county. It's huge. It went from three plants to 30 foot diameter. And uh, they do like to go out and sit. They will come up and they sit at the door at the kitchen every day during mealtimes. And um, the elders interact through the glass doors with them. When the weather is better, we take them out and they interact outside. Um, the ducks are real phenomenal. They're real friendly. They just come up and when you talk to them, they come right up to you. We have chickens and ducks out back. And in the summertime, they plant a garden. And it's nice to go out there and see how things are going. And see the ducks and chickens and, and before the pandemic we had a dog and she was a wonderful addition people can sit down in a chair and have a conversation and that's allowed and before that wasn't allowed. You just came in, you had task after task to complete, and you just went through that ABC through the, out the day, and you didn't have the ability to build the strong relationships. Isn't that sad how Kelly is being honest, saying before we weren't really allowed to have friendship or relationship if you do nothing else but open that door, soften that culture, encourage people to become friends and build relationships, that will change culture. I've heard many culture change leaders say relationship is the key. Build relationship. And notice how it, it matches principle number three. We thrive when we have easy access to the companionship we desire. This is an antidote to loneliness. So companionship comes in the form of people, people who work there, people who live there, people who come of all ages from baby to any age, right? Um, animals, companionship, even plants can be companions to those who love plants. And now combined with principle three, um, three, four, and five are, now, are what are known as the antidote principles. So companionship is the antidote to loneliness. Principle four says we also thrive when we have purpose and the opportunity to give as well as receive. This is the antidote to helplessness. So this opportunity to give, to give care, care for plants, care for the garden, care for the children that come, care for the team members who work here and take good care of me, um, care for one another, care um, gives us this opportunity to give. It's no life to just receive and receive and receive and say thank you, thank you, thank you all day long. This is what people have taught us. And principle number five is the other antidote principle. We also thrive when we have variety and spontaneity and unexpected happenings in our lives. And this is the antidote to boredom. So guess what plants, animals, children provide? variety and spontaneity. Principle six, meaningless activity corrodes our human spirit. Meaning is unique to each of us and is essential to our health and well-being. Meaning is essential to our health. You're going to hear uh, some clips about some different and unique forms of meaning for the unique individuals. Before the pandemic, they had a horse culture out of the arena. And they would take several of us up there. And I would go along just to smell a horse. Wasn't that powerful to hear Patty talk about just wanting to go to smell the horse. You know, in Patty's situation, I hate to say, it'd be very tempting for any of us to maybe assume she couldn't go to enjoy the horses, right? We saw 
people riding the horse, she can't do that. But that didn't hold her back and it didn't hold the people back who care for her and know her. Notice she was raised on a ranch, of course she wants to go. It, it tears me up, to be honest. Ah, oh, it's fun to go out there and watch all the, the chickens and the dogs. And it's nice just to know that they're out there. And now we hear Patty say that she just loves knowing that the <laughs> ducks and chickens are out there. I think that's very powerful, don't you? It just depicts normalcy, doesn't it? Normal life. I just love knowing they're out there. And she mentions we live in a rural community. It makes sense that they're out there. That's a great picture of helping homes get to normal life, real life. I challenge anyone listening to use your budgeted time to create more normal life. Um, all these contrived groups tend to not be what people want. Taking them to the basketball games in the evening time. And over time, it's gotten really good to where the schools really accommodate us really well. Um, we'll let them know when we're coming, they'll let us park in the garage where it's nice and warm. Because if during the winter months, it's very cold. It's nice and warm, we kind of move the elders. And they actual um, put a space just for our elders for wheelchairs in the gym, so. Oh, the high school games. You know how I just mentioned contrived groups? Listen to this story. I've been hearing this for decades now. Out of North Dakota, I'm teaching at an activity director conference. An activity director says, yep, you're right. Guess what? My residents came to me and said, we really don't want all these group activities and we're only going to make you feel better. Wow, talk about institutional culture. You, you see what's happening there? Not only um, are there groups they don't want to go to, but they are going to them to make the team members feel better. Wow, there's got to be some psychology words there that I don't even know. <laughs> and it proves the point, I think. So this wise activity director in North Dakota said, what would you like to do? And they said, you know, we really just want to make, make our LEFSA and go to the high school games. So LEFSA is a Scandinavian potato tortilla, but notice what they're saying. We just wanna make our native foods, our ethnic foods, <laughs> just like at Morningstar, and be a part of our community. What a great way to be a part of your community to go to the high school games, right? See people you know, cheer your team on, and then you even hear Ray say she too loves going, looks forward to going, wow. She doesn't look at it as work. Why? Because she too gets to watch her nieces and nephews play. And then notice the, the, the relationship built with the school. They have their own place reserved. They get to park in the warm garage. That's what we're talking about, everyone. Go live life in the community and give real life to people who live there. Notice how normal that is. On to principle seven. We are more than our medical diagnoses, that's for sure. Medical treatment should support and empower us to experience life again, a life worth living. Medical treatment should be the servant, not the master, is also how Dr. Bill Thomas has said it. So right now, you're gonna see how Morningstar changed its culture changed its systems, changed its focus on medical treatment to instead focus on the people who live there and to give them normal life. They opened dining times, they loosened up a tight med pass, and they stopped waking people up. And if they can do it, you can do it. We do the open dining and the elders can come down whenever they want to eat. There's no set time. We don't wake them up. We don't tell them it's time to eat. My name is Rochelle Powell and I'm a traveling CNA for, I've been traveling for about four years now. Um, 
I'm licensed in 16 states. Me as a CNA, not to have to wake people up. I, I, I enjoy it. It's, I don't feel like I'm pressured to get everybody up at a certain time. I, I have more time to spend with the resident in the morning, getting them up with their cares and, you know, talking with them. How did you sleep last night? How was your day yesterday? And I've got more of that time to spend with them instead of, you know, I have to get everybody up by a certain time. We get to enjoy each other. I get to spend more time with them. I'm not in a rush. I'm not rushing them. We get to do hair. We get, to, you know, I've got to make sure they get their lipstick on, that they, um, their their hair is properly done, um, just the way they like it. When they're feeling rushed and they're feeling like you're pushing them along, we gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta go. So it's just wonderful that we get to spend the time the right way. Wow, I so admire this CNA Rochelle for telling us like it is. Again, <laughs> honesty. She says, I have more time. Who, who gets to say that? Everyone listening? <laughs> more time to spend with the resident, more time to give the good care I want to give, to put the lipstick on and make the hair just like someone wants it, right? I've never heard a CNA say, we actually get to enjoy each other. That is so beautiful and good for her. She says, we get to spend the time the right way. <gasps> yes. Uh, Slava Bhagar said how just fell to rest bevel. You're told what to do and when to do it. It just, to be brought out of a dream state into reality, it's a sad jolt. But it used to be more institutional and they woke me up on their schedule. Now I can sleep in if I want, or wake up early if I want. It's wonderful. I can sleep whenever and wake up when I'm not able to wake up. Oh, I feel more relaxed and my day just seems to go better. And puts me on the bike, really. I, I'm the type of person that I know what I want to do and I know what I'm capable of doing and I don't want to do what they say to do. I prefer to do what I can do. Now, a lot of people have a lot of questions about can we? Can we not wake people up? Isn't that sad? <laughs> Will we get in trouble? Oh, you'll hear it over and over. I have. So I want to show you how the regulations support this. We are looking at TAG 561 self-determination, another way of saying choices. Notice what is highlighted here. People have the right to choose schedules. Just pause there for a minute. If you and I lived in a nursing home, we have the right to choose our own schedule. Ha! Did you know that's in the regs? It's kind of the opposite of what's in most institutions, right? Notice in the parentheses what's added here, including sleeping and waking times. Yes. 
And then look at how strong the next statement is. People have the right to make choices about aspects of their lives that are significant to them. <laughs> is sleep significant to you? It is significant to me. And that's just one example of what might be significant to someone, right? And then when it comes to sleep, what is really true choice? See, we tend to walk around and ask everybody, when do they want to be woken up? True choice is when your body wakes up. Isn't that cool? So we recommend that you make the focus on sleep, sleep, how valuable sleep is, restorative sleep. We're supposed to get at least four hours of sleep uninterrupted in order for our bodies to heal. Did you hear that? Heal. When we wake people up all night, they're not healing. I've worked with teams that stopped waking people up and guess what? Skin is better. Of course, mood is better. Falls are better. Everything's better when you're well rested. And there's more. The guidance here at this reg goes on to say that um, this includes choices about schedules that are important to the resident. Again, waking, eating, bathing, and going to bed at night. Choices about schedules and ensuring that residents are able to get enough sleep is an important contributor to overall health and well being. Yes, it is. And there it is in the regulations. And it goes on, did you know? You must not develop a schedule for care, such as waking or bathing, scheduling for staff convenience, and without the input of the people who live there. Whoa, we must not develop a schedule for care for staff convenience without the input of residents. How many of you are asking, talking about it, would someone prefer not to be woken up? And you know, it's not staff's fault, but it's a way of saying for the convenience of the scheduling, for the institutional scheduling. Many homes have just stopped, they've, they've paused, they've studied it, they've looked at it, they've backed away. And by honoring people's sleep, uh, good things end up happening also for team members. We have story after story that schedules might change. Maybe we don't need everyone here at 6 a.m. Maybe someone can stay home with their kids and help them get on the bus instead of take them to grandma's first. Beautiful stories like that. I've even heard of needing less staff. <laughs> can you believe it? So we now uh, keep hearing how Morningstar did it. So natural awakening. It's something I would want. How about you? And now you get to hear how the nursing team supports sleep <laughs> with the flexible med administration. Make different changes, but from a clinical standpoint, uh, a lot of changes that we saw had to do with um, the med pass. Um, it's an open med pass. Um, there's a more flexible time frame. So we work closely with the providers. Of course, we want to make sure that those medications that are needed to be given in a certain time frame, we follow that as closely as possible. But we interact with the elders. We include them in when they want to receive their medications and also where they want to receive their medications. Some of them want to come to the nurses at the nurse's car and get them there. Some of them prefer to have them given to them in their bedroom. Some of them want them with their meals in the dining room. So it's very flexible to their needs. And we focus a lot on their feedback, include them in that fine eat earlier or later, then the nurse will note that and they'll adjust that medication. And the provider is aware that that is a flexible time. So when we enter the orders in, there is a time frame. It's not this narrow, it's like this. And we rely a lot on the nurses to be independent thinkers. They have to think through those processes because that's education that they have. They have that ability and that's within their scope. As long as we are communicating with a provider and we update them and do the medication reviews and they look back over when that is happening on the frequency. And if there's changes that need to be made, we make those on a permanent basis. But the electronic charting system is really helpful in that for the live charting and the follow-up on that with the providers. Tracking of when medication is truly being given in lifetime and the follow-up with the provider so that the medication orders and adjustments can be made as necessary.
not very often is there a medication that is so critical that they have to be woken up and given it. The sleep is so important to their overall health, the regenerative of muscles, and I mean, on so many levels. LMIMS really thing I have now. Abuse is my voice. And I use it while I can. Somebody tries to force me to do something. I get really irritated. I attend resident council meetings. I've always done that to advocate because I felt there were those that were worse off than me that couldn't attend. Oh, Patty depicts Principle 8 in such a beautiful way. This is actually just the first part of principle eight. Decision-making must involve those most impacted by the decision. <laughs> it's Patty's life. It's Patty's voice. In our movement, we've, we've sometimes referred to the voice and choice. We've got to listen to people's voice. And Patty depicts it better than anyone I've ever heard because it's all she has left. Can you imagine? And this beautiful woman is speaking up for others who can't even do that. Thank you, Patty. Thank you for being a leader in our movement. And then principle eight goes on to say this. And then while they're in the dining room, it you know, gives us time to get close with them, talk to them, sit with them, and see how they like the food. And if they're not liking it, then we can give them something else as long as they're eating. And now we look at the second part of principle eight. Empowerment activates choice, autonomy, and influence. Another way to think of changing culture is you've got to change systems that actually empower the people who work there so that they can honor the people who live there. And that's what you just heard from this beautiful dining team. I'm so impressed. Not only do they ask people who live there if they like the food or want more, of course, we should ask. If you're not, please do but they also observe, hmm, so-and-so didn't eat all their whatever. Would you like me to get you something else? You want me to cut it up better? That is really a beautiful, um, a beautiful way to show decision-making even when the person didn't ask for it, you see? That is team members, care partners, very in tune with the people who live there. It's very impressive. Thank you, Morningstar. I was dreaming about um, oatmeal, but uh, with brown sugar and uh, cinnamon and raisins. And so I woke up craving that. The, ordered that for breakfast, which shocked the cook and everybody, but I got it. I could have to send somebody down to the store to get raisins, but I got it. Wow. Another great example. Did you follow this? Patty normally sleeps and does not have breakfast. Ha! So in many nursing homes, that doesn't even happen, right? Then, even though she doesn't usually have breakfast, she wanted breakfast one day. 
pause do you realize in most institutional nursing homes, this too could be a problem? Why? Because we tend to, I guess, institutionalize people's preferences. Um, we sometimes turn preferences into a schedule. We sometimes assume, no, Patty never eats breakfast. What if she wants to one day? The Morning Star team, they're, they're smart, they're flexible, they listen. It's all about the person, all about the elder. And one day, Patty has a hankering for oatmeal, cinnamon, raisins, and notice, even though they didn't have raisins, what did they do? They even go to the store to get raisins for someone they dearly love. <laughs> it's so good. This is a beautiful example of principle nine, adapting to the person. So principle nine is um, about building a collaborative and resilient culture, that it's a never-ending process. We need to keep learning, keep developing, keep adapting. So that's about the culture, that's about people who work there, continuing to learn, 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 to not ride on your laurels, to never think you're above learning more and changing more culture, changing more language, and Notice how Patty is a neat example of even adapting to the person, being aware that people change too, people's desires change, people's daily routine might be different one day than the next, even though there's a typical rhythm. Isn't that well done? Oh no, it's just the feeling, but this is a world setting. And the ducks and chickens just seem to fit in, make our life complete. And now Patty introduces us into principle 10, which is wise leadership is the key to meaningful and lasting change, and for it, there is no substitute. Very true. So we thank the wise leaders at Morningstar for moving in this direction. And notice, even, even Patty's words are an interesting way of showing leadership because she basically says that <laughs> these animals out there make our lives complete. Do you see that? Wise leadership realizes that bringing normal life to people living in a nursing home is a good thing to do. That's wise leadership. They make our lives complete. How many people are living in nursing homes whose lives are not complete? So a famous tool in our movement is called the Artifacts of Culture Change. And it was actually funded by CMS, Division of Nursing Homes, I was very fortunate to be the subcontractor to design this tool that did come out in 2006 and it helped homes to show the changes they were making. In fact, think of the word artifacts. If you think of a culture that has gone on before us, an artifact is something we find to prove that it existed. So these are tangible, concrete things that you can go look at and practically touch. If there's a dog that lives in the building, <laughs> you can go see it and pet it. And purposely, we didn't make it an interview tool. They also exist, but they're more time consuming. We wanted to get to the practices. And so this tool represents the practices of a change culture. So be aware, watch, look around at the artifacts of an institutional culture, and then realize that there's lots of artifacts of change culture that are now markers of home. They are practices that reflect home. And then we got a grant and came up with an Artifacts of Culture Change 2.0. In fact, the Pioneer Network received the grant, a CMP grant from the state of Maryland. Thank you, Maryland. And we redesigned it and it now has a much more simple uh, tally point system um, a home would indicate whether or not they have a practice fully implemented or partially implemented or not implemented, and I like to add, yet. This really is a self-assessment tool. We, we refer to it as an inspirational and educational tool as well. 
just because if you read it, you'll get excited and you will learn. Uh, and then you could decide to implement some of these practices and then it can be a benchmarking tool where you perhaps uh, complete it annually and see progress. The development of the Artifacts 2.0 version was done very carefully and deliberately uh, by PhD Dr. Amy Elliott, who's worked with us with this tool the whole time and was careful to validate it and also get it published, uh, which it now is, and it's part of the international journal called Activities, Adaptations, and Aging, Dignified and Purposeful Living for Older Adults. In fact, we are making this journal a culture change focused journal, and we do have an open call for papers for culture change and transformation, and we'd love to invite anyone to consider doing some research and getting it published in our journal. The artifacts tool breaks down into five sections. I just want to show them to you because I don't have the time to uh, share the whole tool. The sections are resident directed life. There's life again, being well known, uh, getting to home and accommodation of needs and preferences, family and community, leadership and team member engagement. In fact, many culture change practices do dovetail with CMS regulation we end up referencing CMS regs 52 times and that ends up being 27 regs that are supportive of these culture change practices. We're going to zoom into just one today that's very appropriate for talking about the Eden Alternative. Each resident's comprehensive assessment process addresses the Eden Alternative domains of well-being. I'm going to tell you what they are here in a minute. Notice we also reference CMS TAG 679 activities. Why? Did you know that the Eden Alternative domains of well-being landed in the intent of this regulation. So second sentence, intent. What is the intent of this regulation? To create opportunities for each resident to have a meaningful life by supporting their domains of well-being. CMS even added more to its guidance with one of its next iterations of the regulations because they had not given credit to the Eden Alternative. And so they do that now as well in the guidance and reference the website. So the seven domains of well-being as identified by the Eden Alternative are identity, security, meaning, connectedness, autonomy, growth, and joy. I don't have time to go into each one, but can you imagine living in a nursing home and people actually ask you questions about all these seven domains in particular joy, how would you feel if you were asked what brings you joy? And that's what's happening in the homes that decide to use these domains of well-being, that decide to become Eden homes. And I wanna highlight growth here as well because within the Eden alternative, Eden has taught us to consider not having care plans, but instead growth plans. Wow, did you know? that we're supposed to be growing and developing at every age. So you'll run into that in Eden Homes, just like Morningstar, they have growth plans. And believe it or not, Eden also recommends that we shift over to growth plans for the same reason for people who work there. So instead of employee valuations, they too have growth plans. And if you want to dive into this area of helping people to continue to grow and develop at all ages, Eden and many of us in the movement recommend using the Live Oak definition of an elder. The Live Oak project began in the 70s. Debbie and Barry Barkin created true community, developed community on purpose with the people who live there. And they, the people who live there, the elders themselves, created this definition. An elder is a person who is still growing, still a learner, 
still with potential and whose life continues to have within it promise for and connection to the future. An elder is still in pursuit of happiness, joy, and pleasure, and her or his birthright to these remains intact. Moreover, an elder is a person who deserves respect and honor and whose work it is to synthesize wisdom from long life experience and formulate this into a legacy for future generations. Isn't that beautiful? You can purchase the poster from the Eden Alternative. We highly recommend doing so. And the Barkins and the people who lived at the Live Oak um, nursing home actually read this every day during their community meeting. Can you imagine being reminded how important you are as an elder every day? And how would you like it if you had a growth plan living there that was very individualized? Morningstar shines in this area. And how would you like it if it was all about you? Many nursing home teams wonder how to make it work to have animals, and so we asked Kelly. Everyone takes a hand in helping. We have specific people that are there to take care of them um, in our policy, but our weekend staff are, is wonderful about making sure they're fed, put up for the night, um, taking the elders out to enjoy them. So I think everyone plays a role in taking care of the pets like you would at home. So hopefully you get the idea that Morningstar just makes it work. Kelly makes it sound so easy. And to be honest, that's what I hear from all homes that do this. Honestly, I hear it over and over. People kind of look at you like, what are you talking about? It's no big deal. We all pitch in. We help the dog go out if they need to go out, come back in. <laughs> they always make it sound like it's not that hard. And I so appreciate that. Morningstar has helped elders to have their own dog or cat move in with them at times. Isn't that fantastic? That's considered a culture change practice. That's on the artifacts tool as well. And the very best resource ever, ever, ever created to, to have animals in a nursing home is sure enough done by the Eden Alternative. It's called the Animal Welfare Guidelines. You can, you can get it from Eden. It's written by two veterinarians who have worked with nursing homes. There, there are chapters on every animal you can imagine. Highly recommend it. I also recommend Eden membership. So even though you've heard the terminology Eden registered, um, that has changed to membership. And you can be a member individually or as one home or as a corporation. And I highly, highly recommend it. Why? Perhaps you can see why in this video, but also because it is a form of accountability. If you don't sign up with someone who will hold you accountable, perhaps um, other things take precedence. This will keep you changing culture. Every fall, Every negative outcome can be tied back to those three plagues. You have to analyze it. You have to do that, what would you call it, constructive evaluation of what happened and what was really the root cause. Um, so many times in institutions, they want to just medicate them. Um, but really, are they bored? Do they feel like they have purpose in life? When you honor the elders, you honor everything. And time management, medication, everything. And, you know, that's what I feel is really, truly beautiful about Eden. If we really remember and focus on the thing that always hit me the strongest was just simply the three plagues. 
actually, I have not had any real complaints this entire past year. It's been phenomenal. I really, really love the language part of it, that they are elders. They got to choose that. They wanted to be called elders. They wanted to be respected as an elder. And I love that we live on, on the reservation and that we are in the native population. And when we take our elders into the community, they are respected out in the community. And so are the care partners that travel with them. And I think that's phenomenal. Like when we go to a community feast, they ensure that the elders, whether it be from Morningstar, our community elders are fed first and they are honored. And then everyone else gets to eat afterwards. And I really found that to be something that I was raised with and our elders and our family. And it's just the philosophy behind it has been wonderful. A lot of our, there was a couple of our Shoshone elders. Um, we named the hallways in the Shoshone language. So they're, they're above the wall. And so every time I walk down the hallways, I take a little pride in that when I see um, the Shoshone words on the hallways in each hallway. Talk to them in their language. And I think it kind of surprises them, but then it makes them feel good when someone talks to them in their language because a lot of the older ones that's all they know, that's all they understand. And then we're not going. We had to give them general reminders so that they could go to the dining room and eat whenever they wanted. And they were quite shocked and nervous. They said, are you sure not? We're not getting get in trouble. Thank <laughs> you.